opening remarks, I want to state very shortly that uh, yearly we commemorate the Holocaust uh, in this parliament and uh, it is quite necessary and natural that we also have a close look and an open eye and open heart for the present position of uh, all victims of uh, the the persecution of the Nazi regime, but especially the survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, we should uh, ensure that uh, they have good uh, social welfare. And it should be provided today, and rather than tomorrow. Uh, so we need to ensure that the EU, national governments and civil society organizations cooperate to the best of their abilities to provide the necessary care for victims of Nazi persecution and urgent action is required for the average age of Holocaust survivors is already 86 years. So and now I want to pass uh, the floor to my dear colleague uh, Olga Sinalova from the Czech Republic. Thank you very much Bastian, ladies and gentlemen, uh, also from my side welcome to this, uh, to this event. Uh, Bastian has already said some of the thoughts I, I, had, in, I had in mind uh, but I would maybe uh, say that uh, this is not only a follow-up follow -up meeting of the uh, spring uh, meeting we had uh, here in June, but also there was one in Prague, very important one this uh, the, this spring um, that was that was dedicated to the to the same to the same issue. I think that we all agree in this room uh, that it is unacceptable and hardly understandable that still even 70 years after the end of the Second World War. Uh, there are Holocaust survivors among us that live without an adequate social care in, in poverty, bad health conditions and constant trauma. In 2009, 46 countries, including all EU member states, have signed the Terrorism Declaration. The declaration recognized the special role and capacities of the European Union in securing adequate social welfare for Holocaust survivors and other victims of Nazi persecution. One of the recommendations was to introduce an EU special coordinator to combat anti-Semitism and to address Holocaust era issues, including the implementation of the Terrorism Declaration. And in fact, it was also one of the topics that we, we were uh, discussing uh, during our, our June meeting. Uh, so it is indeed a positive move. Uh, that the European Commission has just recently, a few days ago, announced its intention to assign a coordinator for anti-Semitism and a coordinator for Islamophobia within the Commission. I sincerely hope that Vice President Timmermans, who announced himself as the future special envoy dealing with anti-Semitic and anti-Islamic hate crimes will also stress the importance of promoting the welfare and benefit of Holocaust survivors through the European Union institutions, the European Commission, the European Parliament, and of course, besides these efforts, we must also urge all, EU, uh, all countries to respect their obligations arising from the Terrorism Declaration. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very much looking forward <coughs> to the debate today and let me hope that this is not just another meeting, but we will listen to the concrete experiences from some member states and I'm very proud that we can show a very uh, positive uh, uh, approach from the Czech Republic. And so uh, we will also share the views of, of uh, what has been done and I'm sure this may and will be inspiring in our joint efforts. So let's start our meeting. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleague. I underline every word you said, so that is uh, not uh, often heard here in the Parliament. On the contrary, <laughs> but in this case, I will hardly, will hardly support you. Uh, now I give the floor to the guest and inspire, in source of inspiration, Mrs. Halina Senik. Thank you very. Much. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say that setting from May this year, we made everything we could in order to make sure that the welfare of Holocaust survivors is not a subject for debate, but actually will become a subject of critical importance to most of the countries that endorsed the Terrorism Declaration. 
we had, after the conference, where the co-chairman statement was endorsed, and we are very happy to have one of co-chairmen who was there, here, present today, Special Envoy from Czech Republic, Yuzhi Shitla. We organized a seminar here, as you heard before, and one of the subjects which was raised there <coughs> was the importance of appointing special coordinator, who will be responsible for terrorism declaration issues. Fortunately, during a colloquium on fundamental rights, which we had on October 1st and 2nd, we heard Franz Timmermans, Vice President of the European Commission, saying that the Commission decided to appoint two special coordinators. Before that, what we did was collecting support from civil society, and there was support expressed by civil society organizations, rabbis' organizations, MEPs, WGRO and many, many, many others who supported the uh, claim to the appeal to the European Commission asking for this appointment. And as a result, we see that there is a special coordinator, or there will be very soon. Our next step in this regard is to make sure that the special coordinator on anti Semitism will also be responsible for monitoring the implementation of the terrorism declaration. Because one important part of it is welfare, adequate welfare for Holocaust survivors. Besides what we learned while we studied the situation with Holocaust survivors all over 47 countries that endorsed the terrorism declaration, <coughs> is the unique experience which this organization developed, taking care of elderly people. And we all know that Europe is getting older, we have more and more older people here, and we believe that this experience should be relevant. This experience is something what's been accumulated over the years, and we sincerely hope that we will be able to find synergy between the activities of the European Commission in this field <coughs> and civil society organizations, which have been working, providing care to Holocaust survivors over years and years in many different countries. So I would like to give the floor now to people who will share the best practices and share different approaches to, uh, taken by different governments with you today so that we can hear of what can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aria. Then we, uh, it's, we are very, uh, ready now for, this, indeed earlier, uh, we are uh, going now directly to panel, the first panel on national best practices and I want to uh, give the floor to Mrs. Gili Sitter, uh, Special Envoy for Holocaust Issues and Combat Antisemitism, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. Uh, you have the floor. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you to members of the European Parliament, Mr. Berger and uh, uh, Mrs. Sahnalava for uh, hosting this event and for to the uh, European Shoah Legacy uh, Institute and uh, Harina and her team for uh, organizing it uh, uh, and uh, also uh, thank you for giving me, giving me the award as the first speaker. Uh, in the uh, panel, I think I don't deserve it. It should be actually our uh, Israeli friends because the biggest group of uh, uh, Holocaust uh, survivors lives uh, today uh, in uh, Israel. But since this is a follow-up event to the uh, Terezin uh, conference in 2009 and also to the uh, conference on welfare uh, for uh, Holocaust survivors and other victims of Nazi persecution, which took place uh, in May in Prague in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in which I had the uh, honor uh, to co chair with uh, Ambassador Stuart uh, Eisenstadt. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, that I can uh, start this event with uh, some remarks, some information about the. Uh, social care, about the care for Nazi victims uh, in the uh, Czech uh, Republic. I don't want to go too deep into the uh, 
history of uh, how, how it was handled over the time since 1945, but still I have to mention, uh, mention the uh, law from 1946, it's the law 255 from 1946, it, because it's still uh, valid today and it's still a basis for uh, the definition of uh, survivors and for many social uh, <coughs> programs we have even uh, today. Uh, it's a law uh, about, uh, uh, five, it's called, uh, because of the language of the time, uh, uh, about fighters for national freedom and there are different categories including uh, soldiers, members for resistance, but the, the, the paragraph which is, uh, which is important to us, the paragraph about so-called political uh, prisoners and political, uh, the word holocaust was not so much in use back then, so the, the uh, political prisoners, they included uh, uh, victims of, I quote correctly, victims of political, national, racial and religious prosecution, it was the definition. Uh, of that uh, time. So it included victims of uh, racial persecution, but it was not only uh, about them. And uh, until today, the holders of the certificate, which is called 255, the number of the law, they are the target of the social measures uh, by the uh, Czech government. And we usually don't know, because they have the certificate, and we don't know uh, because it's not in the certificate why were they persecuted if they were maybe as a member of the resistance sent to concentration camp or if they were Jewish or not we, 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 we uh, don't know for us it's important that they were, they were in the concentration camp or in a uh, Nazi uh, prison in the communist times uh, the, the 1946 it was not yet the communist times but after 1948 yes. still the law was uh, applied and the same definition uh, was uh, used and the, there might be cases where uh, the people who deserved the certificate and didn't get it for political uh, reasons but still uh, in general the law was, uh, was uh, applied and the people got all kinds of benefits, they got special pensions, but also uh, uh, at that time they had, which meant it was important, they had better access to housing or they could get a, uh, I don't know, a telephone line because it was like used for telephone lines, but that was not, not, not so easy to get one, so they had a, they had a preferential uh, treatment or they had, uh, I don't know, in public transportation, these kind of things. Um, uh, after 1989, uh, most of the relevant benefits were maintained, like the pensions, but of course the better access to telephone lines, etc. became obsolete uh, with, with, with the time, uh, but, but the pensions and, and uh, other, some other uh, benefits were uh, maintained. But uh, because uh, Czech uh, Nazi victims, including uh, Holocaust survivors, uh, is opposed, and I think it's very important, to most of the victims in, the, in Western Europe or United States or Israel didn't have access to any compensation from Germany whatsoever because there was this Hallstein uh, doctrine which, uh, according to which no payments were done to uh, communist countries and this doctrine was actually maintained even after 1989 uh, so the, the, there was no uh, the, the uh, laws uh, or agreements which Germany made with Western countries didn't apply uh, to Eastern, uh, Central and Eastern uh, Europe uh, at all and um, uh, the relative German legislation its validity is expired already in 1989, so it was not, it was not uh, extended. So they didn't get any compensation according to German BEG and, and, and uh, other. This was uh, partially uh, remedied uh, by, uh, after establishing the Czech-German Future Fund in 1998, and from which there was a social program for Nazi survivors and they got in addition to the 
money they were getting from the Czech uh, uh, government, they got uh, some money uh, as a social contribution uh, from uh, Germany via the Czech German social, but also considered uh, compensation, but as uh, social assistance. And then in 2001, after conclusion of the of the negotiations uh, of compensation for forced labor, it was for the first time when the victims in Central in Eastern Europe were treated the same way as the victims in, 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 in Western Europe for the first time, that they got the same kind of uh, compensation. Uh, somebody living in the Czech Republic or Ukraine got the same as somebody living in New York or Israel. It was the only uh, such uh, compensation program where they were treated, uh, treated uh, equally. So after 1989 and bef before especially these uh, two programs from Germany, uh, the Czech government tried to kind of compensate for the fact that they didn't get the compensation by itself. And so in addition to these old uh, pensions inherited from the communist times, there were some uh, new programs uh, introduced and they consisted mainly, it was a series of uh, not pensions but lump sum payment and the first one was in 1994, there was a uh, special uh, law where the so-called uh, political uh, prisoners, of the definition from 46 included uh, Holocaust survivors, they, they received uh, uh, com uh, payment from the uh, Czech government, which was uh, it's difficult to calculate today, uh, but, but in today's money it's about 5,000 euro per capita. Back then it was probably more than that, you know, given the purchasing uh, power. And there was a series of other such lump sum kind of law, uh, payment laws after that by the Czech government for different groups of people and one important development took place that the definition for these 255 was a little bit relaxed because previously it didn't include people who were in the hiding because it talked about political, uh, the wording was like political prisoners, people who were uh, detained was usually for more than three months, and if it was under three months, uh, uh, if they had some uh, damage uh, caused to their health or something like that. Uh, but uh, it didn't include people who were uh, forced to hide. And I think uh, we have here a representative from our Ministry of Social Affairs who so might correct me, uh, but I think it was in 2001. Uh, when the definition was uh, kind of relaxed and became more inclusive and, and, and uh, so more people had access to, to, to these, uh, to these uh, payments. And in addition to these lump sum payments, there were several, uh, several uh, <coughs> government decisions or laws by which uh, the government paid also monies in, in different uh, foundation to, to uh, foundations to uh, providing social care for uh, survivors like uh, National Endowment Fund for uh, Holocaust uh, victims uh, or uh, Ezra Foundation and uh, several others. So uh, I think in that, that uh, the accumulated amount of money paid in this lump sum payments would be about something about 150 million uh, euro from 1990s until today, in addition to the pensions. I, have to, I, have to, I don't have the numbers uh, because uh, for the pensions because it's very difficult to, to uh, calculate from 1946 uh, until today how much, how much uh, was uh, paid. So uh, uh, I think this this lump sum payment contributions to the foundations. This is the main, main. It was the main vehicle from the Czech government how to how to uh, assist uh, Holocaust victims uh, and and other um, uh, Nazi victims. Uh, I, just to to give you some numbers or how 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 the situation uh, changed uh, over the years in 1994 when we had this first uh, lump sum payment, there was still 
over 25,000 uh, people who were survivors of concentration camps, Gestapo prisons, and, and others who got the lump sum payment. Uh, in uh, uh, 2001, when we had this program from Germany, from the uh, uh, for forced and slave <coughs> laborers, uh, for the category which is very roughly, not exactly, but roughly the same as the category who got the uh, lump sum payment in 1994, which is the slave laborers category, uh, so-called category uh, A, it was. Uh, I think over 8,000 people, so in, in 2001. And today, when we uh, try to collect data, how many survivors we have uh, today from roughly the same category, I think it won't be much more than 1,500 today. Yeah. yeah. So you can see that, that, that the, the uh, numbers were, of course, naturally, dramatically. Uh, diminished because uh, because uh, simply it's people in their around their 90s unless they were children of course at the time of their uh, uh, persecution uh, these numbers I'm speaking only uh, about concentration camp uh, inmates Gestapo prisons etc I'm not talking about uh, members of resistance who are not detained or, or soldiers who fought against Nazis, etc. because of course it's a different, it's a different uh, issue, a uh, different uh, category. And um, in May, uh, when we had the uh, honor and pleasure to host the uh, European Shoah Legacy Institute conference uh, on welfare for uh, Holocaust victims and uh, other Nazi victims, uh, in Prague, living under the title of Living with uh, Dignity, we adapted the, the uh, final concluding co-chair uh, statement and there were some uh, ideas what should be uh, done, uh, of course, to continue to care about, about uh, those survivors who are still among us and we are currently kind of considering another uh, program for these remaining uh, 1500 or maybe more because we might include veterans also and, 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 uh, so we are now considering another uh, program uh, for them but it's still in its uh, initial, uh, initial uh, phases that's one thing another thing was that, that uh, there was a call for more support for organizations who care for survivors or for associations of uh, survivors. So uh, the uh, Ministry of uh, Defense uh, decided to a little bit relax the criteria, criteria of their organizational support and open the possibility uh, for organizations not only of uh, veterans, of soldiers, but all others who fall under the law 255 that they might be able possibly in the future to apply for, for uh, funding. Uh, the Ministry of uh, Social uh, Affairs and um, so the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs uh, it has a program for uh, programs for senior citizens so they also decided to open this program for organizations of, uh, of uh, Nazi survivors or, or survivors of Nazi uh, persecution, including uh, Holocaust victims, so they could apply for, for uh, funding uh, from that, uh, from that uh, project. We have been also able to convince uh, some companies, private companies, to contribute uh, for some, to social uh, programs for Nazi survivors. So, uh, some of the bigger, com bigger companies, they have their foundations and they are, uh, it includes uh, social care programs, so we convince them they should target also uh, this group and there are already uh, successful cases, we, we know that they already gave, gave some money for that. And also we decided uh, to give additional 100 million, which is roughly 4 million euro, to the endowment fund for uh, Holocaust victims in the in the 
Czech uh, Republic. So this is the, let's say, the developments from May after the uh, conference, the, the last, last uh, programs which I uh, mentioned. So uh, that's roughly, I don't want to go into more detail than that, not to, not to overwhelm you, but I am ready to answer any questions you might have about these issues. And uh, yeah, you mentioned, of course, the, the, the nomination of the coordinator for uh, to combat anti-Semitism and, and uh, to, to uh, follow the Holocaust-related uh, issues. Uh, also, which was also part of the uh, concluding statement of the conference, so we are happy uh, that, that uh, it materialized or it seems to be materialized. Yeah. May, may I uh, thank you warmly, uh, Mr. Sittler, for your very interesting, uh, stimulating overview. And before passing the floor to Mr. Abi Weber from uh, Ministry of Social Equality uh, of the State of Israel. I want also to give shortly the floor to the co-organizer of this uh, seminar, uh, my dear friend uh, Rabbi Tavi Tavir, director of the European Jewish Community Center. Uh, please, you have the floor before we continue with benefit. Uh, I hope that you allow us that we should already uh, start it. First, excuse my delay and. Uh, Thank you for altering the program for me. Um, so I'll be, I'll be very short, obviously. Um, first of all, uh, I thank you all um, for, for allowing us to be part of, of this conference. Um, in Alexandria, 2,000 years ago, the Ptolemies, the Greeks who took over ancient Egypt, were one of the only kingdoms in the ancient world to invest much of their wealth in knowledge. They build the greatest library on earth. Maybe one of the reasons that we're holding the seminar today. Um, there's no doubt that the numbers of survivors are decreasing, but at the same time their needs are expanding, and we, as people who deal with them, learn over the years more about their needs. The survivors, from one end, have today a will to seek for assistance. This is also something that is very important psychologically. In the 50s and 60s, most of them would be like the grandmother you, that you've just uh, mentioned. People would like to alienate themselves from the experience that they had in the Holocaust. People try to keep distance. People try to start their lives. People try to build their families. And people try to rebuild the basic humanity once again. Over the years, those who've survived and managed and had families and had kids and had ki grandkids became old. They became old and of course also because of the uh, terms that they lived in, in the camps and then the persecution, they became sick. So the goal that came apparent also to the Israeli government relatively late into the game was the need to assist them now. And for that matter, as of uh, 2007, the Israeli government has extended tremendously its programs understanding and recognizing that we're not talking only about symbolic measures and that there are acute, actual, factual needs of survivors that one has to address. And in that respect, as of 2007, several very important steps have been taken care of and I would like to quickly go through with you about them. Firstly, um, the um, direct costs of living of survivors and the needs for medical care and support. Uh, the needs uh, for medical care is now covered by a state uh, law covered by the state budget. And the assistance to the needy survivors I'm going to come into in a few minutes touches the um, joint work of the government with the uh, NGOs uh, active uh, for survivors in Israel. A second interesting, simple, but very efficient uh, measure taken by the government is the establishment of a, of a call center. Uh, when we decided, uh, or when we concluded the chairman's uh, declaration in, in Prague this year, and we had our internal discussion of, of what should be put out to the world also as soon as possible, was again the need for um, call centers and some information centers that would allow survivors and their families to contact in order to receive and get the information. Each country has programs. Uh, 
Mr. Chichester just uh, mentioned uh, the situation in uh, the Czech Republic. Of course, in Israel, we have uh, a various range of, of legislation, but in other countries too, such as Belgium, I assume, France, uh, the Netherlands, and other countries, you have quite a lot of programs working for survivors. Having said so, the information flow and the understanding of the particular program and the particular legislation, the particular right, is not always there. So one of the calls that we came out from the uh, latest uh, conventions that we had in, in, in uh, Prague would be to think of promoting this model and um, making such, such focal points for survivors in other European countries. That would be, uh, in any case, something that would allow the countries to communicate the rights of survivors directly to their citizens and it would um, factually bring to a lot of improvement. The second uh, measure is of course the direct support. Um, each country according to its budget and its uh, ability supports and assists uh, survivors. Um, after the uh, um, conference and in parallel to the conference we've also learned of some changes made in other European countries. I would not like to take this floor or this opportunity of, 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 of counting them but there has been some progress also in other neighboring countries in their uh, rights for survivors and in opening up either existing programs in the same or following the Czech model I might, I might say or in, in increasing uh, existing pensions. The Israeli government has decided as of 2004 um, to uh, tremendously increase the direct assistance for survivors, uh, unifying for the first time since the establishment of the state all pensions. This means that as of 2014 every survivor is entitled to have the same services, the same pension, the same benefit regardless of the original um, legislation regulating his right. Another important move that uh, is important to note is, of course, the understanding that the government or authorities do not have direct contact with the survivors. And not only do they do not have the, the direct contact with the survivors, they don't have the ability to mobilize the survivors and to interact with them on a daily basis. That's why the government has increased its support uh, to NGOs that assist in direct contact with direct daily needs of survivors. This would be their day-to-day -day physical needs, just the ability to see somebody once a week to talk to him uh, and to make sure that they're not uh, there alone, but also in their medical and other needs as well. I'm, I'm sure that the uh, uh, representative of the uh, uh, Future Fund that uh, is here with us today would be able to tell you more details of uh, the, the joint project that her organization is doing in Israel. And we are very thankful as a government that we have the uh, uh, assistance and support of the Jewish Claims Conference in, in running those uh, different uh, programs. Uh, all in all, uh, if I'll try to sum uh, uh, the steps undertaken by the government in order to give you some sort of uh, idea of, of things uh, to be done, or could, could be done. Firstly, um, it's important to make sure that your, your citizens and your survivors know of their rights. We are all thinking always that everybody knows, most of them are very old, and if we don't have direct accessibility to the people, they will not know of their rights, they will not know of the changes, and they will most probably not be able to claim and receive everything. As Mr. Sisler just said, there are also other programs going on. We have learned the last year, for example, of the special fund for children who are survivors of the Holocaust negotiated between the Claims Conference and the German government. Those survivors were not in direct contact and were not interacted to the information regarding to their rights would never be able to receive their uh, money because they would never apply. This is an experience that we had also in 2000 in the Slave Labor Fund, where one of the goals was to make sure that uh, people are notified of their rights and people know what to do. And in that point, local governments uh, that would uh, adopt the model of a center or an information center done by the government uh, would be doing a tremendous um, 
honor and service for their supporters and also be able to assist them in receiving their needs. Furthermore, governments can uh, uh, engage uh, with, uh, with NGOs in order to increase the direct services for survivors. Um, as I've mentioned, that, the, that is divided again into two, direct support in uh, uh, actual needs and uh, indirect support in facilities, increasing of hospitals, increasing of services such as Amcha, again, it's a service that I'm sure that is well acquainted also to the uh, Future Fund, uh, services that are uh, allowing survivors to receive uh, support, help, medical or uh, psychiatric, that allows them to finish their last days in, in great or bigger, greater honor. Um, I don't think that Israel has, uh, Israel is not, uh, I would say, proud in, in what it, it does because we feel like this is, uh, this is a, a obligation that we have to, for survivors. And uh, we are watching together with, with our Czech colleagues um, the ongoing dialogues with different uh, governments in Europe, and, and there is progress. So uh, I would like to conclude my a uh, short presentation actually in thanking the organizers of this event and thanking our long friend uh, Ambassador uh, Schittler for uh, supporting this process that is a, a long, complicated, but if you do the stock takings over, over the periods of time, you see how much you can achieve. And if I want to interact again in what we said in the last time we met um, a few months ago, I think there's such discussions would give both uh, the, the people who take part in it ideas, but hopefully will mobilize us to, to uh, achievements. Uh, of course, the commission, uh, with its decision to appoint um, some focal point to somebody that might coordinate this, this important issue, might, might be also a very important step forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Weber, for your uh, clear uh, presentation. You already hinted on the subject of our panel uh, too, on uh, the role, the important role of NGOs uh, uh, on the uh, standard of living and the dignity of life of the survivors of the perse persecuted persons by the Nazi regime, especially. Local survivors. We have short time, but uh, when there are questions to both speakers, uh, be free to mention uh, your name and put your question to them. Whom can I invite? Yes. Um, hello, my name is Diane Lukizer, and I am the. Your name is? Diane Lukizer and I'm working for HECC and um, I would like to ask um, about um, the second generation, um, uh, the family of the victims and the second generation, so that concerns me for example. Uh, I, I heard um, someone uh, among the, the audience uh, from a previous um, event who said that uh, the second generation uh, suffer a lot uh, about uh, this um, after the Holocaust and some silence in the family and uh, secret. And um, I would like to, to know, it, of course, uh, we cannot claim money for generation after generation and you will just have the cycle of hate against uh, so much victims who are something, but I would like to know if there is uh, something done somewhere for the second generation the victims. Thank you for your important question. Now, who may, may ask to, yes, Mr. Weber? I'll be more than happy to answer the question as uh, this is, of course, uh, an issue that is uh, discussed in Israel. Um, I'm going to use now my trick, uh, putting on my other hat, not as an advisor, but of my academic background as a lawyer. Um, we have to differentiate between two things, compensation and rights of survivors and assistance, uh, medical assistance or any assistance whatsoever. I wish to draw a very clear line because um, one of the things that we are, 
always coming across is the question how far, how many, how long, what other groups and so on and so forth. So I think that with the second generation, the biggest issue is that it's the second generation. And in any tort law that you have, there has to be a point when you have to balance between the damage and the group of people who, who receive the damage. Um, so that's the general legal, I mean, compensation comes from the uh, initial thought that both human rights were infringed and deprived, but the second tier, the actual law, it comes from tort law. Tort law, one of the biggest um, basics on which it stands, it's the, um, the vicinity between the damage and the person. I'll give a very short example that is not connected at all to Holocaust survivors. You are sitting in the car, your car is being hit, the person next to you dies. Okay? You're physically intact, nothing physically happened to you, but you stayed in the car next to a person who just lost his life and you're sitting there and you experience the whole trauma. That case definitely is not going to be the same case as the cousin sitting across the street waiting for your car to arrive, seeing the accident, and for sure not to his wife hearing over the phone about the accident and what just happened. I'm making this, this very banal academic example to show that there is some sort of a way that you have to manage. In this context that we're sitting here today, what we're trying to do in the last few uh, uh, months, I think that it's important for us to propagate for survivors. I think that there is still a lot to be done. I think that Mr. Schitzler indirectly explained how much work there is to be done in several countries that were over the years, because of this policy of not exporting pensions uh, beyond, beyond the Iron Curtain. Um, we just came back from a visit, for example, in Serbia, there's the same situation, they had no rep uh, compensation paid any in over the years. So we have to find a way of uh, dealing with it. And here comes the having said so. Having said so. We still have to recognize the fact that under medical uh, uh, research that is now undergoing, there has been proven fact that second generation, again in very specific cases, again unfortunately probably like example number one, okay, there are people who are affected. What we're doing in Israel for that matter, and I think it's the same in Germany but I'm not sure, as a state, we provide over our social services, social services assisting the people. Meaning that if someone, as being a kid of a Holocaust survivor, surviving Auschwitz, used to receive beating from his parents because he would leave food on the table, or would used to have a freezer full of bread because his parents were traumatized for not having anything to eat, so and so, and I don't want to go into break into the example, they will receive medical assistance, health, psychiatry, AMCHA, again, I think I'm saying it again, it's the organization dealing with uh, the psychological situation of survivors, they too give ser uh, service to second generation. But compensation programs for second generation, I think that this is too early to speak of. I am neutral about it, but it's far. We're probably more focused on how we can assist the living, but... I think, uh, I think about the same uh, lines and specifically uh, in the uh, Czech Republic, uh, the government rather provides some funding to organizations who again provide uh, social and psychological care also for the second uh, generation and including uh, with a, uh, a home for seniors, Hagibor for, for uh, Jewish uh, survivors. So they accept also second uh, generation. Um, there are organizations uh, attached or, or aligned to the uh, Federation of the Jewish Colonies in the Czech Republic who provide uh, social care in the regions and they include also uh, second generation, again, social and psychological 
health and we have also uh, organization Jivat Amit Living Memory who provides the same kind of help to, to both Jewish and non-Jewish uh, survivors of Nazi persecution and they get uh, government uh, funding. Also, but this is already, I would say, there are not so much second generation but direct survivors, but I mentioned these lump sum payments, yeah. but we have cases of orphans, of people who, whose parents were, were uh, killed let's see, by, by uh, Nazis and who survived and who were not themselves directly in the camp, but they suffered the loss of their parents, so they also got financial, direct financial payment, but they are considered to be direct survivors because of death. So that is kind of a uh, border case. Yeah. Thank you much for uh, answering this important question and for your elaboration on it. Uh, quite informative. But uh, allow me uh, and apologize. We, uh, my dear colleague is Mehrlia, uh, for there are a lot of things to do this <laughs> afternoon. Uh, so I, uh, when you allow me, I want to, uh, to pass the floor to her for the second panel, then we uh, are on time. There's or more. Thank you very much, Bastian. It's very kind of you and very impolite to our to our guests. Uh, but let us let us continue with the with the second panel. <coughs> um, well, I think uh, it has been already said how important is this to to have the direct uh, direct contact uh, with the with the Holocaust survivors. How important is the issue of providing good assistance? But I think that the role of the NGOs is also to keep the awareness uh, within within our uh, our societies i think that's that's a very important part of of um, of our uh, efforts so the second panel is called the complementary approaches cooperation between governments and ngos and uh, we have four speakers um, uh, here and let me introduce them uh, all and then i will uh, pass the moderation of this panel to Halina. Uh, so first we have Mr. Jovan Tegowski, uh, uh, International Holocaust Remembers Alliance uh, National Coordinator uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Macedonia. Uh, then uh, we will have uh, Ms. Aneška Nekovářová, uh, who is the project manager uh, of the European Shoah Legacy Institute from the Czech Republic. Um, then we have um, uh, Ms. Eike Brown uh, from the IVZ Stiftung uh, from Germany. And um, uh, last, but of course not least, uh, Mr. Yossi Ives, uh, Chief Executive of the TAC International Development. So uh, let us start with the first speaker, please, uh, before source. Thank you very much, uh, respected uh, uh, Vice Chairs of the EP delegation with relations with Israel, Ms. Senalova and uh, Mr. Belder. Distinguished uh, MPs, uh, representatives of the NGOs, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, allow me to express my sincere gratitude uh, to the European Shoah Legacy Institute uh, for the invitation to address this important event. As representative of a non-EU member country, Macedonia, but uh, which is at the same time a candidate uh, country for membership. The very dynamic era of globalization and rapid developments <coughs> we are living in, to mention just the current refugee crisis with uh, human beings in its center, preoccupies our daily attention and focus of our activities. In such an environment, very often, we do forget or put aside important issues from the past, issues which have a direct impact on the lives of persons who went through an unprecedented tragedy. Therefore, the ESLI initiative to putting and keeping the issues of the welfare of the Holocaust survivors high on the agenda of different stakeholders, including the EU institutions, is of utmost importance. The recent news from the first annual colloquium on fundamental rights in the EU about the intention of the European Commission to appoint a coordinator for anti-Semitism and a coordinator for Islamophobia is encouraging development and in this context and uh, are in line with the uh, ESLI appeal in, uh, in this respect. 
Uh, I do agree uh, with uh, the, the, the uh, mentioning uh, from the beginning that uh, the, next, uh, the next step is uh, even more important uh, and uh, that is the uh, practical realization of this intention and uh, more important the mandate of uh, this uh, coordinator to include uh, the issues we are dealing uh, today uh, or were on the agenda of the Prague conference. The civil society as representative of the general public interest that provides the social power of its networks of people and serves as the bridge between governments and citizens is certainly another very important stakeholder to addressing appropriately these issues. The prominent role the civil society has achieved at local, national and international levels does not allow the governments to ignore it. Thus, their ideas, information, services and expertise should be used to press forward the interest of people by seeking to influence the state. Consequently, the best practices and experience of the NGOs and civil society as providers and supporters of the care to different vulnerable groups of our society, societies such as the elderly population, could also be applied to the Holocaust survivors. The practical implementation of this approach would be a valuable contribution to securing better and decent life for this category of people. As we all know, the conclusions of the Prague Conference have stressed the need for an appropriate and efficient partnership between international, national, regional and local stakeholders with the NGOs and civil society. As each of them has comparative advantages over the others, the effective partnership could mutually reinforce each other's work and we should invest our efforts to achieving this goal. But at the same time, we must be aware, aware of some challenges in certain countries the relationships between governments and the civil society are different. Sometimes they are sensitive, sensitive, sometimes it is more a question of attitudes and prejudice that prevent valuable co collaboration. Sometimes there is a lack of sufficient financial support. In view of the current circumstances and the goals we, don't want, uh, we do want to achieve, I join the appeals about the need to support NGOs financially to facilitating their cooperation at national and international levels, to securing EU funding for civil society organizations involved in the provision of welfare for survivors. Let me say a few words about, uh, a few words about the situation in the Republic of Macedonia. Although the Jewish community in my country is relatively small, around 300, uh, 300 people, the government has been actively engaged in many Holocaust-related issues and has implemented different measures in the areas of compensation of the Jewish property, remembers education. Even prior to the adoption of the Theresian uh, Declaration, has taken measures uh, in this respect. The most important legal act in this area was the 2000 uh, denationalization law and in particular its special, special provisions related to the uh, uh, property of uh, the Jewish community in Macedonia. This act was followed by uh, a signature of compensation agreement in December 2007 and the process of payment of, amount, uh, uh, of the amount of 21.1 uh, uh, million of, uh, euro in form of state bonds <coughs> that started in June 2009 and shall be finalized in June 2018. Up to date, 15.6 uh, 15 million er, uh, euro has been paid. A special fund for the Holocaust of the Jews from Macedonia was established and the, ma and the major result was the construction of the Holocaust Memorial Center, Center of the Jews from Macedonia officially opened in 2011. The Macedonian Minister for Labor and Social Policy took part at the International Conference on Welfare in Prague, thus confirming uh, our interest about all issues that were subjects of, uh, subject of this important gathering. The actual number of Holocaust survivor in, uh, survivors in the Republic of Macedonia is very small, nine, 
and the domestic leg legislation in force does not provide specific benefits, benefits or allowances for this category of people. <coughs> However, taking into account the conclusions of the Prague Conference, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has initiated a process of internal consultations involve, involving the Ministry of Labor, Labor and Social Policy, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Health, Jewish Community of Macedonia, and the Holocaust Fund of the Jews from Macedonia, with the aim to discussing the possibilities of uh, finding uh, certain solutions related to medical and social programs and other benefits for this group of our citizens. In this process, <coughs> we will involve the interested NGOs who are active uh, in the field uh, of providing care for the vulnerable category of people. The preliminary reactions of the Ministry of, uh, particularly the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy, regarding uh, this initiative uh, were uh, very positive and we will keep us informed about the follow-up of this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Tegarski, for your very interesting presentation. I would like to invite now to speak about um, the importance of supporting of non-governmental organization, uh, our manager, Anushka Nikolaeva, who was very essential, instrumental, as many of you know, in uh, putting together this seminar, along with uh, Vendula and Ellis, who have been working hard to make sure that we can all enjoy an interesting event. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear MEPs, uh, rabbis and diplomats, Mr. Belder and Mrs. Sehnalova, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for being here today. Uh, we strongly believe that your presence uh, indicates your concern about Holocaust survivors and other victims of Nazi persecution and your intention to help them. I'm going to talk rather in general terms about victims of Nazism, the best practices, experience of need and needs of NGOs providing care to victims of Nazism and possible transplantation of these NGOs experience for a wider group of elderly people in Europe. Article 25 of the European Union Charter on Fundamental Rights stipulates that the Union recognizes and respects the right of elderly to lead life of dignity and independence and to participate in cultural and social life. Um, among the elderly, we find very frail group, Holocaust survivors and other victims of Nazi persecution, whose age is 86. Uh, this group includes roughly 500,000 Holocaust survivors and more than 1 million people or um, other victims of Nazi persecution. The vast majority of survivors, and you can see uh, numbers on the figure on the slide, the vast majority of survivors and other victims of Nazi persecution live in the United States, Israel, Central and Eastern Europe, France, and the United Kingdom. Uh, while there are instances in all countries where national social safety nets are too thin, the evidence is overwhelming that uh, victims of Nazism face the largest threat to their welfare in the countries of Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union countries. Increasingly, uh, victims of Nazism face challenges in their material, psychological and social well-being. Mm, thus, in Europe, one of five elderly people live uh, below the risk of poverty level. The share of elderly people at risk of poverty ranges from below 10 percent in Iceland, Germany, Sweden and Central Europe to one in three in the United Kingdom. In all European countries, elderly women face a higher risk of experience, experiencing poverty than uh, men. Uh, for instance, women uh, over 65 in Sweden are twice as likely to suffer poverty than their male counterparts. In some cases, uh, the unique challenges faced by Holocaust survivors and other victims of Nazi persecutions are um, hard to distingu distinguish from those normally faced by older persons, yet research shows that they are peop these people are often in dire situation. National governments, which bear the primary responsibility for welfare of their citizens, 
uh, must ensure that victims of Nazism, like others of advanced age, can live their uh, remaining years in comfort and dignity. I also would like to draw your attention uh, to long-term care, we, especially in home care, which has emerged in the last decade as a major, major priority policy in most recent declaration countries. Here again, uh, there are indications of inadequate access to care in different countries, with the greatest difficulties being faced in again Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union. Long-term care in home has been uh, recognized as especially important for survivors in order to avoid any possible re-traumatization that may occur if individuals are returned to the pardon, regulated environment. Uh, given their advanced age and specific needs, uh, life of uh, dignity can only be achieved uh, by guaranteeing access to these much needed health and long-term services. Without access uh, to quality long-term care, survivors' well-being, dignity, health, and even life may be endangered. Unfortunately, the cost associates uh, with such services often put a serious strain or even can exceed uh, the regular income of person in need. And in the area of health, people in Europe can usually expect uh, most of the cost of their care is covered by social protection systems regardless on their own financial situation yet in most countries long-term care uh, is regarded and treated differently from the health care even though that underlying causes are both health related mm, just for instance just two hours of everyday care can cost more than many people's pension Mm, quite often families bear uh, the responsibility for paying for long-term care. However, many Holocaust survivors don't have any family to help them, so they are totally dependent on uh, care provided by national governments and local civil society organizations. This makes them even more vulnerable to indignity and uh, poverty. Uh, Holocaust survivors and uh, other victims of Nazi persecution represent a very interesting group from the perspective of planning for Europe's aging population. Uh, due to numerous international agreements, this group has been receiving um, assistance from German government, distributed internationally with the assistance of non-governmental organizations. And uh, we sincerely believe that this experience of these NGOs, their skills, observations, networks, and practices of engaging younger generation and thereby boosting employment, it's of particular value of aging Europe and should be studied and where um, possible, replicated. Besides, we still believe that these organizations need support, which is not always available from uh, national governments. So it is very important to gain uh, involvement of the European Commission in, pro in providing incentives to national governments for supporting these NGOs. On, in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet uh, Union countries, non-governmental organizations play a key role in providing in-home care and support to victims of Nazism. These NGOs help with daily activities such as bathing, dressing, cooking, shopping, serving meal, even winter relief. However, uh, Holocaust survivors and other victims uh, suffer greatly from loneliness and isolation, and we know that the isolation is the shortcut way to abusement. These people, they need to be uh, involved, heard, they need to feel useful and important. So the psychological care and social reintegration is very important as well. Uh, nevertheless, due to uh, financial limitations of many organizations, they are only able to provide uh, fractions of these necessary care or services, which means that many survivors of Nazism receive limited care. Uh, this is an unacceptable situation as civil society uh, organizations are essential in providing care services to victims of Nazism, particularly in countries 
uh, with un underdeveloped security systems, social security systems. Uh, secured financial support and increased international cooperation between civil society organizations <coughs> would enable them to better ensure life of dignity and respects for many more uh, victims of Nazism or elderly people general. Uh, furthermore, I uh, would like to share with you some experiences or uh, best practices of NGOs who have been constantly working on enhancing life of victims of Nazism. Uh, AMCHA, already mentioned by Mr. Weber, organizations uh, um, based in Israel, so as was mentioned, they provide uh, psychological help and assistance. And I think that it's interesting to mention that they provided 166,000 hours of the therapy and 30% of these were provided in home, care, in home to survive with restric restricted mobility. German Action Reconciliation Service for Peace operates net of volunteers. Uh, they send them abroad for one year uh, to take care of victims of Nazism and elderly people. And according to their experience, uh, the interaction between generations is invaluable and quite often a strong bond between care provider and care receiver is emerged. Uh, this organization works in 13 countries. Austrian Service Abroad is an institution which provides young male Austrians with a government-funded alternative to the compulsory military service. Its main focuses are social work and Holocaust memorial service. In Ukraine, organization Turbota established the phone line for victims of Nazism and elderly people, and they can just simply call there and have a chat, because it's very important for them to talk to someone. Um, in conclusion, decades of experience, methodology and the development of social security systems could be adapted into a broader and more defined approach to the care of Europe's elderly population. This could potentially create many new opportunities for partnerships and for interconnecting aging with employment by providing training in long-term care to long-term unemployed and other sectors of society, particularly vulnerable to unemployment. And uh, it is our intention, European Shoah Legacy Institute and TAC Institute would like to create such a project in the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ineshka. And now I would like to invite to talk Al Kebran, our very dear friend of Wesley, who was helping us out to organize the, uh, the conference which we had in May, and who is still with us. Thank you very much for coming here, Elke. And please, the floor is yours. Oh, Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear diplomats, dear Mr. Belda, dear Mrs. Uh, Shernanova, dear colleagues from the European Shaw Legacy Institute, thank you very much for inviting me here and uh, speaking to you and for giving me the opportunity to talk about the NGOs, the Foundation Remembrance, Responsibility and Future is supporting. Um, I was asked to speak about the impact of the NGOs on the life of the victims, but before coming to this, please allow me to a few words about the foundation I'm working for. Um, I have prepared a PowerPoint. Unfortunately, some of the letters might be too small, so I will follow my text and <laughs> try to, to read what, what is not readable on the PowerPoint, but there will be also some a few pictures, so, so yeah, I will draw attention to this. Uh, Mr. Schittler already mentioned that the foundation who was established by the German Bundestag in the year 2000 was uh, the first great program which was directed to uh, Holocaust victims and actually former forced and slave laborers, and not only in the western part of the world, but also in Eastern Europe. And, uh, the foundation was established with two main tasks. The first task were, were the compensation, which were paid until uh, the year 2007 together with 
colleagues from countries as the Czech Republic, <laughs> the German Future Fund there, and other Eastern European countries as well as the Jewish Games Conference. Uh, and uh, jointly we compensated uh, 1.6 million uh, former slave laborers who received a small only actually mm, significant amount uh, which was not really a compensation but a payment who should recognize uh, their suffering. Uh, our second task is a permanent task, which is to fund projects financed by the revenues uh, we are yearly earning, which is about 7.5 million up to 8 million euro yearly. Next slide. We use it for uh, actually in three funding areas where we are supporting projects, which is uh, the first area is the critical examination of history and of course the reminiscence uh, of the Nazi crimes. Uh, the second funding area working for human rights and the third funding area is the commitment to the victims of national socialism which actually in this year was all most financed with 47% uh, of the whole yearly budget because we also find it much more important to, to work in this field. Uh, regarding the commitment to the survivors, uh, the foundation EVZ uh, has defined and is guided by three main goals. The first of these goals is actually uh, directed to the survivors themselves. Uh, we want to fund projects in Central and Eastern Europe, as well as in Eastern Israel and in Germany, that allow elderly survivors of national socialist persecution to lead a life in dignity and autonomy, and to improve their situation in terms of health and social security. We also want to strengthen, this is our second goal, the actors of civil society who seek to promote a greater solidarity with and willingness to help victims of national socialism. Uh, we fund best practice projects that offer decent standard of social and medical care or support intergenerational dialogue to engender respect for the life histories of those persecuted under the Nazi regime. And uh, our third field of work is actually, which we also do by supporting organizations like ESLI, is we want to call upon politicians and society as a whole in Germany and Europe to accept their responsibility to improve the social situation of the Nazi victims. Um, next slide, <laughs> please. So I would like to come now to the to the question I, I, I have asked myself uh, by, when preparing this presentation. Can you please continue once more? Yes. So, so I asked myself uh, five questions which I would like to go into. First of all, who are the victims of Nazi persecution apart from Holocaust survivors? Then what are their needs? We heard a lot about this already by Aneshka, so I will be short. How do NGOs contribute to their well-being and what is the impact of their work? And maybe my last question is how could the European community support NGOs caring for survivors and why? Next slide, please. Uh, and do, 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 do. Yeah, next one. Yeah. So it's starting starting with the problems and the needs of the survivors. Uh, Aneshka already presented the main problems elderly survivors uh, are suffering from, so I just mentioned shortly a few points. We are mostly speaking about a forgotten group that needs recognition. In Germany, in this year, we started a campaign, I'm Still Alive, where elderly survivors spoke up and gave us their picture so that we could present them and just remind people that there are still people living among us who are living, 
who are survivors of the Holocaust, who are not already dead, as everybody assumes in everyday contact. What we hear from the colleagues from Israel is actually that one of the biggest problems um, next to care is loneliness for people who have lost their families, who were not able to build a new family, or whose children uh, have immigrated to other countries. Of course, they are very old and connected with this is an extreme vulnerability. There are health-related consequences of persecution who make this fate even harder. And many of them suffer from psychological problems and sequential traumas, especially in countries where we have a war nowadays. And again, uh, end of call, all of them. Because many of them need professional home care to enable a life in dignity uh, because being institutionalized will trigger again new traumas when people come to, uh, to a state where they, they are more and more dependent. Next slide please. So, our foundation yearly supports about 100 NGOs in seven countries uh, and they are serving a total of 30,000 persons approximately. And uh, they are working in very different fields and uh, have very specialized approaches actually focusing on the needs of survivors. Some of them provide professional home care and uh, organize daycare centers. Uh, some organize social clubs, warm homes close to their apartments where they are living, uh, which are meeting places. They support self-help activities and uh, some of them very specialized psychological and psychosocial support, as for instance the Jewish community and the Central Welfare Agency for the Jews in Germany in a very good project which we support. Other organizations uh, organize home visits by volunteers, like the Action Reconciliation you mentioned already. Uh, they provide practical support, cultural activities, advocacy work, organizing, yeah, and another field is the advocacy work. Some of our partners also organize round tables with responsibilities of, with representatives of government agencies and with public administration. They work on local, on regional, and also on national level, and sometimes manage to, uh, to get, to gain the interest of the government representatives and even uh, yeah, are successful in changing some, some minor political uh, <coughs> situations. Um, the next slides will be just some examples of projects we have, like this is Home Visits, Meeting Point in Prague from Jiva Pamiet, Care Projects, uh, Generational dialogue in Israel by the Foundation for the Benefit of Holocaust Victims, medical care and supplies, volunteers supporting survivors, survivors of Roma victims uh, supported with emergency aid and home visits and also calls for donations for survivors like here in Russia. Uh, this is a picture of a generational theater which was developed jointly with, uh, with a group of survivors and youth in Kiev. Uh, yeah, the impact of the NGOs, let me find my slide. Uh, so, our foundation commissioned a study of the, to the Heidelberg University and uh, for a couple of years, a group of gerontologists accompanied uh, our projects in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus and uh, interviewed the, the participants. And they actually found out that projects focusing on social inclusion and intergenerational dialogue 
uh, not only contribute to the psychological uh, well-being of the participating Nazi victims, but also to their physical well-being. They, the people remained more active, and uh, actually we were very, very proud that our approach funding projects focusing on on meeting points and meet on in social inclusion and on the intergenerational aspects of of uh, dialogue uh, have been yeah, recognized as efficient and uh, helpful for the victims because we see that on the other hand uh, Social care, medical assistance is and will remain always the task of the government because uh, it cannot all be provided by NGOs. Nevertheless, uh, some of the home care and daycare centers, for instance, of the Jewish Hesed organizations in former Soviet Union in Russia, are acknowledged as model projects for elderly care. They actually are representing the state of the art of care for elderly people, which uh, yeah, other people would love to, to join <laughs> if they were able to. So I think there, there are really some good models which should be, should be actually uh, made known also to politicians of their own country. Uh, we already heard about the very interesting and good and qualified work of organizations like Amcha in Israel, who are internationally recognized for their expertise in working with traumatized victims. And we, today we know how important it is that uh, there are specialists who can work with traumatized victims. And their experience is not only important to work with Holocaust survivors, but could be also very important to deal with the people who are traumatized by today's conflicts. And I think, I think there is also a very good uh, opportunity to, to think about how we can transfer the knowledge. Uh, all of the projects we support really contribute to a better understanding between our countries because many of them work internationally and they are committed, these NGOs are committed to European standards, to European values and actually contribute to social change in their country and in the European community and the neighboring countries. So my last question and the next slide is actually what could the European community or the European Parliament actually, how could they support these organizations? And the first thing is maybe a simple tool but I think it would be important to mention the Holocaust victims, the victims of the Nazi persecution, in your policy papers as a most vulnerable group and a group that needs special attention and care and acknowledge these special needs. Uh, I think the European Parliament and community also could help to highlight best practice projects uh, in order to uh, improve the national social policy approaches and put pressure on the national governments to, to care for their survivors. And of course it would be also very great if European community could fund networking and exchange of experience between, between the NGOs in member countries, in Israel, and in the countries of the former Soviet Union. Thus, stabilizing the civil society and also contributing to a better exchange of experience. Uh, and we have already mentioned them. <laughs> support and continue supporting international volunteers caring for survivors and support the transfer of knowledge. And for example, uh, from, from experts like Amcha to other experts. Uh, yeah, this, this is actually my recommendations. <laughs> and uh, I would be glad to hear your questions and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Elka, for this very interesting presentation. Um, 
And I would like to invite our last speaker for today, uh, Yossi Oves, who is Chief Executive of TAC International Development. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as, as the last speaker, I feel very responsible to make sure that I'm entertaining um, and brief. Someone once gave the following advice. Make sure to be nice to your children because they will choose your old age home. We are the children and we get to choose how our forebearers or our elderly get treated. And this brings with it a real responsibility. Um, if nothing else, because our children are watching us and we may get the same. So we can set an example about how we treat people who've come before us and who've sacrificed greatly so that we can have the world that we have today. So much has been said. I want to thank um, our hosts and uh, honored guests. And I won't give all the names because I promise to be brief. I, you would expect me to say, very pleased to hear so many speakers mention about the importance of working with NGOs. Government is obviously very important, but there are organizations that have developed really valuable knowledge in how to roll out projects, and together we can achieve a lot more. And as you heard also repeated so many times today, the issue of care, and in particular home care, is one that stands out. Um, because it is so central to providing a dignity and providing a basic standard of living to people who are most vulnerable. I won't explain why, because I think the other speakers have more than convinced you, if you're ever going to be convinced, as to why this is an important matter. And you've also heard, as uh, Aneshka, I think, again, has covered it fully, that there are some countries that are doing a great deal and providing fantastic level of service and there are some countries where there's a significant gap. What I think I took from speaking to, I didn't know you're allowed to call it Esli, um, and what I've seen from what I've looked into the past few weeks since I got involved in this discussion is that the issue of home care is the most obvious and outstanding and most solvable problem that we have to make things better. That's not to say there aren't many other things that need to be done, but this seems to be the most obvious way in which we can make an immediate impact upon their lives. Um, there, there is a, I'm not going to bother with the slides because you can't read them, but I've actually got a slide in front of me here which is a direct quote from the database on national social welfare policies for survivors and other victims of Nazi persecution, which you all know, and which is, a, it's over there in case you want to see it, but um, it, it, it's a segment, very succinct, in which it comes out from this substantial document that home care is the most or one of the most significant areas where uh, more is needed and where the opportunity is most obvious. So what, what could we do? My organization, TAG International Development, is, as its name implies, an international development organization that specializes in using expertise from Israel in other countries. And I came to, to learn that one of the largest NGOs in Israel is called Home Care in, in, in Hebrew. And there are some extremely um, successful examples that have dealt with this population for decades and other vulnerable populations for decades but at a time long before the so-called high-tech boom in Israel when Israel was on the verge of economic collapse and where, where it was a very different situation and it had to be extremely efficient and extremely cost-effective and extremely resourceful in how they did this and therefore we have examples of remarkable success in how to make sure that people do get the care that they need without to use the English expression breaking the bank without it becoming a cause of bankruptcy and what's beautiful about the what happened there is that they managed and nobody even thought about it at the time 
but by, by coincidence managed to solve an even bigger problem in a way, which is what to do with so many people who can't find adequate employment. And home care became a huge industry for people who needed a job, many of whom were highly capable, but for circumstances were unable to, to get work. For example, if you're a, a, a mother of young children, it's very difficult to be under the, the, the you know, nine to five structure or to have to work in a very inflexible manner. And the same goes for people who are older. Maybe a person's retired at 55 as a lawyer, found it too stressful, needs to, 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 to do something else, and they, have a, they lack opportunities. And so home care is a great way to, on the one hand, help people. And the beauty of it is that they were therefore able to attract very high quality people that provided an extremely high quality of care. Because one of the things we need to realize is that it's all very well sending somebody to somebody else's home. Who are you sending? What on earth are they going to do when they arrive? There are all kinds of horrendous examples in Britain where I come from. It's been scandal after scandal after scandal where people have been abusing older people, stealing from them, mistreating them, neglecting them. We're talking about doing something that's going to make things better. You need to have a system that provides you the ability to, to do so to a very high standard. So quite a bit of it has been said. I'm not going to repeat it. The kind of services we're talking about but it comes, it's everything from helping people to prepare meals, to helping them to get out of the house from time to time, to ensuring they get access to simple services, even if that's simply getting their mail or getting their pension or whatever. For many people, this is by now a very difficult thing without some kind of support. I want to emphasize, and I'm going to be very brief, emphasize the, the, the word quality, which I already referred to. The point is that a home care service has to be done in a way that the recruitment attracts the right kind of people with appropriate skills, with the right levels of empathy and commitment and so on, that the training is done so that the home care professionals are able to deliver a, um, a care service to the right standard, where there is trust, in other words, where there's a great deal of emphasis on safety, integrity and dignity and courtesy, things which sometimes are lacking in the care services, and possibly more importantly than anything else is oversight creating a system in which people aren't just given a job and left to get on with it, where there's a great deal of, um, of, of quality assurance, people got continually um, uh, supported, the carers themselves can get very traumatized from going through quite a difficult experience on a daily basis, they need to have um, psychosocial support as well. My mentioning these things is only just to show that in the most broad sense possible, not all home cares are born equal. Um, there, there are, there's, there's a way of doing it that is very cost effective and very high quality in the ways in doing it which are, um, which are, are very troublesome and, and, and possibly um, best, best to avoid. So in conclusion, I'm hoping that my, my children, if they ever put me in an old age home, put one in on the one that I just described, or if I get home care that it's of a kind that I just described, where people are treated with dignity and people are um, understood just because they're older and vulnerable doesn't mean to say that anything will do, especially as we're talking about some of the most vulnerable people, this becomes all the more important. I want to again um, um, thank, thank my hosts. I want to explain that uh, this invitation for me to be here today came about because of uh, several discussions we've had over the past few weeks, including with, with Elise, um, about using this fantastic opportunity, and I was loving to hear what you're doing as an organization, I think there's a natural synergy there, that, that we have so many people wanting to do something, and maybe there's an opportunity now to do something that not only will make an immediate impact upon the lives of the hundreds of thousands of Holocaust survivors, especially in some of the places where the provisions are, are, are weaker, such as in the, the Eastern European countries, but here's the big thing that really excites me, and this I will end. We spoke about the Shoah legacy. The Shoah legacy has, has its obvious meaning, which is that there, that there was consequences, and those consequences of the Shoah haven't gone away, and they will continue, as we heard, even to the second generation. So that, that's an important issue, the legacy of what happened 70 years ago. I, I, I'm half German, and one side of my family, virtually the entire family, was wiped out. Clearly not everybody else, I wouldn't be here, but pretty much everybody 
and was wiped out. I'll just say anecdotally, I remember as a small child going into my parents' bedroom and seeing a black and white picture of three boys standing there looking in their typical sort of German, um, what was, you know, sort of traditional sort of, what well, I guess boys wore in the 1930s or something. And I, I asked my mother who these boys were, and why they were on her, I never got an answer. I now know they were her uncles. Um, the point is that we, we have a legacy, and we have, to, we have to take responsibility for that legacy. But there's another legacy, a really positive legacy, and that is by virtue of what we do for the Holocaust survivors, we can set a gold standard for the whole continent about how we treat older people, about what it means to deal with vulnerable populations. And I think that if we could create a home care service, maybe it starts out because of a concern for Holocaust survivors and other survivors of Nazi um, atrocities, but it becomes an opportunity to celebrate that you know, the, the potential we have when we work together to make life better. I think it will be a double legacy. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yusuf, for your very interesting presentation. And now there is the possibility of asking questions, if you have any. And if you don't have any, oh yes, please. Hello. Yes? Okay. So my name is Svetlana Antonova. I am a representative of the um, Board of Welfare of Jews in Germany. And we are working in very close contact with uh, FLZ Stiftung, with Mrs. Elke Brown, and we are working in close contact with AMHA in Israel, Martin Auerbach, and with some. And since uh, this year, we are working also with ESLI. And it's very interesting, it's very important, everything that was uh, spoken about here. We, uh, I could say that uh, we have two uh, points in this. Um, uh, coordination of this uh, uh, welfare uh, work for Nazi survivors and we are dealing daily with this work in our office because we are an umbrella organization for the Jewish communities in Germany and we, are, we have already collected a uh, big experience in this case and um, but as far as I said, uh, we have two points: a theoretical point, experience, and so on and so forth. But we also need money in order to um, implement any project or in order to open a new day center that we opened already for Holocaust survivors in Germany with the help of FLZ and Claims Conference and some other donators. We need money, and in this case, I'll say that uh, time is our big enemy because um, we could collect uh, experience and it's a good dynamic, but we have a very bad dynamic. So, in this case, the Holocaust survivors die, they die daily. And uh, so, I spoke with Halina already. Uh, it's very important, very, very, very important that was said here. But uh, would we see any frame of time when we when we'll start uh, to get more money from EU Parliament or from EU commissions and so on? And one question more for the um, organizations: Do we uh, have already experience with working with such group of Holocaust survivors as dementia patients? in Israel or somewhere else. It's very important now for us. Anyone wants to answer? I can, I can start with the financial. I can tell you what we will do because we've been doing it as promised after the international conference in May. So after this meeting, we're going to have a conversation with the representative of the European Commission. European Parliament doesn't provide money, financial support. It's talk to the European Commission. And uh, we <coughs> will raise the issue about funding, which is already allocated for programs aimed at aging a population of the European Union, whether we can add additional focus. And also our attempts are now to put the terrorism declaration within the mandate of the newly appointed or would be appointed soon special coordinator on anti-Semitism. Again, to reinforce the possibility, to increase the possibility of getting financial support for NGOs dealing with these issues. 
Just to, uh, just to say, I mean, briefly, the answer is yes to the second question. Um, I didn't go into detail, I promise to be very brief, but part of the problem of, of dealing with older people is that they're not problem free. I mean, no, no, no population is, but you know, they've, they've accumulated health issues, psychological issues, all kinds of things, and that we, we knew, we do, there's no point coming into this with naivety and bringing in people who have no experience and no understanding of how to deal with these populations and make matters worse. So that's why I agree with you, we need to do this thing properly and fund it properly and make sure that we create something which we can be proud of and which is really going to uh, live up to the standards uh, that Europe uh, expects. And we don't end up just running around just trying to be nice to people and understanding that it's a bit more complicated than that. Some of these people have been through a tremendous amount in their lifetime.